For 50 years, the moon was silent until a private rocket called Starship Flight 11 thundered into space on October 13, 2025, proving reusable spacecraft were no longer a fantasy. Suddenly, SpaceX wasn't just chasing dreams, it was rewriting the rules, its engineers betting everything on bold risks and rapid failures. But while everyone watched the spectacle in Texas, something far bigger was unfolding. China's lunar program, quietly advancing with methodical precision, now stands ready to challenge what SpaceX believes is possible. This isn't the old race for flags. This is a fight to control humanity's next home. What shift triggered China's bold challenge, and why does Flight 11 change everything about our future beyond Earth? At 7.20 a.m. Central Time, the countdown clock at Starbase reached zero. Starship Flight 11 thundered off the pad, 33 Raptor engines firing in perfect unison. The super-heavy booster, standing over 230 feet tall, pushed the stack clear of the tower before throttling down for stage separation. Hot staging, where the upper stage engines ignite before the booster fully detaches, worked flawlessly, a maneuver once considered too risky for operational vehicles. Seconds later, the booster executed a controlled flip, reignited its engines, and steered itself toward a splashdown in the gulf. Telemetry confirmed intact grid fins and a vertical descent, validating the water landing system that had failed in previous attempts. Meanwhile, Starship continued its climb. Engineers at Mission Control watched as the vehicle coasted in microgravity, then initiated the first in-space restart of the upgraded Raptor 5 3 engine. The timing was critical. At T plus 140 seconds, a guidance engineer, tracking anomalous inertial data, recommended a slight delay in the ignition sequence. The adjustment paid off. The engine relit cleanly, delivering the precise velocity needed for the payload deployment phase. Eight mass simulator satellites, packed into the new spring-loaded PEZ dispenser system, released one by one. Each deployment was tracked in real time, with no sign of jamming or collision risk. On re-entry, the heat shield tiles held firm. Flight 11's descent profile matched predictions, with surface temperatures peaking near 1,800 degrees Celsius. The ship banked hard, shedding velocity before pitching up for a controlled splashdown in the Indian Ocean. By the time the telemetry stream ended, every major objective, booster recovery, engine restart, payload deployment, and re-entry survival had been achieved. For the launch operations team, this was more than a checklist. It was a vindication of years spent fixing failures, rewriting code, and trusting the data. Each step, captured in mission logs and radio chatter, now stands as proof that rapid reusability is no longer theoretical. It is operational reality. At Starbase, risk is not a liability, it is a tool. The culture that shaped Flight 11 was forged in the heat of repeated setbacks and public failures. SpaceX's approach is simple in theory, but demanding in practice. Fly early, fail openly, and learn faster than anyone else. Every launch builds on the lessons of the last, and every mistake becomes a stepping stone. When the Raptor engine restart anomaly surfaced in real time, it was a guidance engineer, whose name rarely appears in headlines, who made the decisive call. Tracking inertial data that deviated from simulation, he advised a split-second delay in the burn sequence. The recommendation broke from the planned script, but the team trusted the numbers. The result? A clean ignition, stable trajectory, and averted disaster. This is the heart of SpaceX's engineering edge. Decisions are made at the console, not in committee. Leadership encourages bold calls, so long as failure is treated as data, not defeat. After Flight 8's explosion, 
Debate raged through the night. Some pushed for caution, others for progress. Musk's stance was clear. As long as a catastrophic failure mode is understood and addressed, progress must not wait. That mindset has become company lore, repeated in mission logs and post-flight debriefs. It's the reason why Starship's heat shield now survives re-entry, why booster landings are routine, and why real-time course corrections are not just allowed, but expected. In this environment, the bar for technical excellence is set by the willingness to act on imperfect information. SpaceX's engineers live by the mantra that every risk, if managed, is a shortcut to mastery. For competitors, the message is unmistakable. Safety is not the absence of risk, but the relentless pursuit of solutions when the unexpected happens. The lessons of Flight 11 now ripple outward, raising expectations for what is possible and what is required in the race to build humanity's future beyond Earth. In January 2019, the Chang'e 4 lander touched down on the far side of the moon, opening a new chapter for China's lunar program. Communication with Earth was made possible by Kuaikiao, a dedicated relay satellite stationed beyond the moon at the Earth-Moon L2 point. This relay allowed surface science and rover operations in terrain that had never before been explored. The significance ran deeper than technological novelty. By returning the first samples from the far side, China's science teams gained access to untouched regolith, material that preserves the moon's early history and hints at resources hidden beneath the dust. The Chang'e 5 mission, launched in late 2020, brought back nearly two kilograms of lunar soil from the near side. Laboratory analysis in Beijing and Shanghai confirmed the presence of rare isotopes, including traces of helium-3, as well as water-bearing minerals. These findings fed directly into China's long-term plans. Helium-3 for potential fusion energy, water for life support and fuel, and titanium oxides for construction. In 2025, Chang'e 6 went further, collecting samples from the South Pole, Aitken Basin, and delivering them to labs equipped for isotopic mapping and volatile extraction studies. Each mission expanded the catalog of lunar resources, transforming the moon from a symbol of exploration into a field of practical opportunity. Above the Earth, the Tiangong Space Station has operated continuously since 2021, serving as both a research platform and a training ground for Taikonauts. The station's modular design and steady rotation of crews reflect a philosophy of incremental, permanent presence. In policy documents and technical papers, Chinese planners outline a vision. Robotic missions lay the groundwork, sample returns guide site selection, and every new analysis shapes the blueprint for future lunar industry. The foundation is being set, quietly and methodically, for ambitions that reach far beyond science. At a test complex on Hainan Island, the ground shook as seven YF-100K engines roared to life. This was the static fire of a Long March 10-core stage, China's answer to the heavy-lift rockets shaping lunar ambitions worldwide. Engineers monitored thrust curves and vibration data as the engines sustained full power, validating the design's ability to deliver nearly 900 metric tons of force. With each successful test, confidence grows that Long March 10 will soon launch crew and cargo toward the moon, matching the scale of Starship's feats in the West. But brute force alone is not enough. CNSA's planners have set their sights on the next challenge, how to build on the lunar surface with what is already there. In academic journals and technical briefings, the vision is clear. Turn lunar regolith into bricks and structures using 3D printing. Preparations for Chang'e 8, scheduled for 2028, are already underway. This mission will deliver construction test beds to the moon's south pole, 
aiming to print the first blocks from local soil. The process, known as in situ resource utilization, promises to reduce the need for costly supply runs from Earth, laying the groundwork for permanent bases. Behind these advances stands a new generation of designers, engineers who have spent years refining engine clusters, perfecting ignition sequences, and modeling the chemistry of lunar dust. Their work is less visible than the spectacle of launch, but just as vital. Each static fire, each laboratory print, is a step closer to a future where China's presence on the moon is measured not in flags, but in lasting infrastructure. The tools for permanence are nearly ready, and the countdown to a new era has already begun. International alliances now shape the rules of lunar engagement. The Artemis Accords, drafted by NASA and signed by over 30 nations, promote open data sharing, peaceful use, and transparency in space activities. These agreements encourage joint missions and standardize how resources are handled, but they also exclude rivals who reject their terms. In contrast, China and Russia have advanced the International Lunar Research Station, or ILRS, with language emphasizing sovereignty and independent control over outposts and discoveries. This legal divergence is more than paperwork. Export control laws like ITAR restrict American companies from sharing sensitive technology, even with allies, complicating collaboration and slowing innovation. The result is a world where access, partnerships, and even the flow of information are dictated by which block a nation joins. On the moon, as on Earth, law and politics decide who gets to build and who is left waiting at the frontier. At the lunar south pole, sunlight brushes the crater rims for up to 90% of each year, powering outposts and shielding equipment from the deep freeze. In the shadows, ancient ice lies locked beneath the regolith, water for fuel, air, and survival. These resources draw every major mission to the same narrow band of ridges and depressions. As launch manifests fill for 2028 through 2030, simulations by mission planners reveal a crowded corridor, overlapping landers, orbiters, and supply craft, all vying for the same sunlit plateaus. Even a minor miscalculation could send debris across a landing zone or sever a vital relay. Draft protocols for real-time coordination now circulate between agencies, but the risk window grows tighter with every announced mission. The South Pole is no longer a blank slate. It is a bottleneck, and the next move could decide who stays and who yields. On October 13, 2025, SpaceX's Starship Flight 11 achieved the first in-space Raptor 5 three-engine restart and a precision booster hover splashdown, setting a new benchmark in reusable launch technology. Across the Pacific, China's Chang'e and Tiangong programs have delivered the first lunar far-side landing and returned rare samples, while the Long March 10 nears operational status for crewed missions. Both nations now target the Moon's South Pole, a region mapped for water ice and near-constant sunlight. Yet much remains unknown. Key technical details from China's lunar roadmap are classified, and international coordination protocols for lunar traffic are still under negotiation. The evidence is clear. Private innovation and state strategy are converging on the same goal, lasting human presence beyond Earth. As new legal frameworks and resource claims take shape, the outcome will define who shapes the next era in space. The future of the moon is no longer a question of firsts, but of permanence.